so much for joining here and i usually i do this quick introduction explaining how you ended up here in your case is the horizons uh, network and we're both speaking at this uh, large online event with a thousand speakers uh, in the same day I, I, I still believe it's the largest one day event in the world that has ever been hosted until someone proves me wrong or keep on saying that but a thousand speakers in one day is impressive but, um, nonetheless but um, also impressive is the work you do, right, with the World Happiness Summit and the fact that um, you are in many ways navigating uh, this gold mine of interest. Like if you think of Laurie Santos and the fact that she is the most popular class ever, uh, you know, there, there are some statistics in terms of uh, the work that she's doing, uh, which uh, you know, clearly prove that uh, this is something people deeply care about as they should and that you're right in the center of that uh, maelstrom so thank you so much for joining us today and uh, welcome to the stage thank you so much and thank you for the work that you're doing to to reach uh, the global youth and to give them a, a sense of hope and meaning and wisdom so thank you very much for inviting me yes uh, you talked about happiness it's a subject that i care very much about so maybe I will begin with what, uh, what, I, what we mean by happiness. Um, so I get asked uh, many times, is, is happiness a choice? What is, is it just about feeling good? So what we can choose is the process. So happiness is a process. Um, and, and there is a paradox. If we if tackle happiness directly, we actually become less happy. So what we need to do is approach it indirectly by looking at our relationships, our physical well-being, uh, intellectual well-being, our um, our life uh, situation, our um, our health, and uh, and so on. And so by by engaging in, I call them a, a, almost like their attitudes or ways of being. For example, forgiveness, kindness, altruism, gratitude. Um, if you if you spend time on these different notions and, uh, and, 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 and follow some of these evidence-based evidence tools, you can then elevate the positive emotion. So it has, happiness has a, a, an emotional part, which is positive emotion that feels good. And then kind of a cognitive part, which is all these other things with, matter, with mattering values, um, mindfulness, et cetera, that I was describing. But what is amazing is that in all circumstances, it's really a win-win situation. So it elevates the way that individuals feel. It elevates relationships. Um, it is good for your immune system. It's very much, we know that there's a mind-body connection. So there are physical benefits to elevating your well-being. There are direct business results. Children do better in school and then they do better later on in careers. Um, so there's this, these are so many, so many impactful benefits of happiness. And of course, um, governments uh, ha have uh, the opportunity to put this into policy. So like governments of New, uh, in New Zealand put well-being in the national budget in 2019. So we're beginning to see a movement that goes beyond the GDP and to measure success uh, beyond just economic success. So that's really exciting. You mentioned Lori Santos. So Lori uh, taught the most popular class in the history of Yale University. Another of our speakers is Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar. He did the same um, at Harvard. He taught two of the most popular classes in the history of Harvard University. So we can see that it is a popular topic and a much needed topic and particularly for the youth even before COVID, we saw that, um, that there were a lot of factors influencing young people and feeling isolated, socially isolated, for example, um, with, the, with social media and not having healthy digital um, um, citizenry, uh, uh, citizenship, as, as it were, how we engage with social media and the impact of that. Um, so that has had been already increasing the levels of isolation that the youth were feeling around the world and, and even more so now with COVID. 
And so with the work that I do through the World Happiness Summit and Wahasu um, is to bring this to a large global audience. So from students to parents, to professional coaches, entrepreneurs, business leaders, government officials, change makers. And the idea is that if we take a holistic approach, an evidence-based approach to well-being, then we can have these win-win scenarios that I was describing earlier. Now, my personal journey on um, to happiness was actually through uh, loss and grief. Um, in 2013, I lost my husband suddenly of the flu, actually. And, uh, and of course, I was hugely impactful for myself and my family. And at first, it was very challenging to, um, to, to, to overcome that and to live through that. But I did make a conscious choice that I was going to live because I had children. I was going to live uh, happy, and I didn't know what how to do that. And through, so my journey was through purpose and meaning. And so I, um, I, I, four months after my husband died, I was doing an MBA at Georgetown University, and I graduated, and I and I was able to get a really good job in what was my background before I started doing happiness, and that's uh, crisis communications, and I did very well, but I didn't have purpose and meaning, and so that was very important to me um, to to really tie into that, and so my journey has been really um, abrupt in a way, as it were. My career uh, has been abrupt. But at the same time, um, it has been amazing. It has been really amazing because what a privilege to get to talk about this subject that I believe in so much. I have seen the benefits of it since our first summit in 2017 uh, in Miami. We also hold a government meeting that we call the H20. And that one is to bring, uh, like I mentioned before, well-being economics and the impact of this science into policy. So that is our attempt to start moving the, um, the dial to get governments aware and then involved in, in civic well-being and what that looks like and what does country success look like. So um, our event is highly um, experiential because we need to involve all the senses uh, to, to, to really understand uh, and feel really feel what a uh, happiness and to understand that it's an internal um, it, it's of internal control and it's about reframing and it's about looking at life in a certain way and it is not about avoiding pain or having rose colored glasses but it is about also looking at what is going right because many of us at this moment um, things could be better and things could be worse, but at this moment, we're okay. And I think we, we forget that because our brains are naturally negatively biased because of evolution. So for example, cavemen needed to pay attention to, to the tiger versus a rainbow, and that was evolutionary important. But what happens now is that sometimes we're having many rainbows and there is a kitty cat and that we treat that as a huge threat and we don't notice all the things that are going well. Um, it's also amazing for uh, resiliency building when life happens. So, you know, the challenges that we face with COVID been hugely impactful to everyone. And we've all had losses, both big and small. And by practicing the tools um, that, that, uh, that are science uh, driven and that are evidenced by the last 25 years of research, we can then uh, use this to build our resiliency and, and, and really grow through trauma. That's what I experienced. I, I experienced uh, post-traumatic growth after my husband died and I was able to achieve things in my career that I never even thought were possible. Um, I've had the, the privilege and opportunity to speak on many different forums around the world and share about this, um, this knowledge that we have available. And I've seen the impact around the world and it's very exciting. And um, I choose to be optimistic in what is possible uh, in the future. I think that this has been a collective uh, trauma and it's an opportunity for us to 
start uh, speaking a different language, a language of well-being and treating each other like, uh, like we matter. So it's important to, in our communities and, and speaking now about students um, that are feeling maybe disengaged because they're missing their community, they're missing the rituals that happen through school and their friends, that um, we understand that we're in this together you know, it's happening around the world. Uh, students around the world are reporting this. So it's not, sometimes it feels like it's just us that it's happening to, but it's, it's, a, it's a collective feeling. And the other thing is that, that it will end, that, that this will end and we will get back to being able to see people in person and socializing. And it's important to note that when it, when people say social distancing, it's really physical distancing because humans need social contact. It's actually really, really important. And the number one indicator of happiness is the, the, the nature of your relationships, right? So some of the ways that we can engage are like what you're doing right now, that we can go on this forum and see each other, speak to each other. We can text a friend um, and set up times to see each other, um, uh, to see each other in, in the screen because it's not like live in person, but it's, it's, it's close. So um, we can do that. And if we're feeling lonely, instead of waiting for others to reach out to us, perhaps we can reach out to them because then that also activates our um, altruism loop, which makes us feel better when we're doing things for other people. And then they feel better. So then they reach out after you. And, and so those are important things to, to note. Also journal writing is incredibly impactful to write about the experience, to put your, your thoughts down to try to um, get, in, get into some exercise if you're able to and it's safe to do so outside, that's really important. Um, and just as, as, a, as a note of, you know, through, through my career and my journey, um, I think it's really important to understand that, um, that failure is just a word and really humans learn through experience. So failure is just growth and innovation. It's an opportunity to innovate. And one of the speakers says, um, uh, learn to fail or fail to learn. And so um, I encourage uh, the youth that are listening to this to um, try new things and understand that there's a lot of learning even in, in, in what we call failure. Um, and there's a there's so many opportunities that we can't see in the moment. I certainly didn't see that this was going to be my career trajectory and being involved in trainings and chief happiness officer programs and inventing all these things that I've had the privilege to do um, through this experience that I've had the last, uh, the last eight years of my life. So um, I'm really excited because people like you, Marcelo, are putting this together the other speakers that are also joining here and to give different perspectives. It's so important to look at, at well-being through different lenses. We're all saying the same thing, whether it's happiness or, or well-being or, or, or health. Really, it's about sustainable well-being. It's about looking at the environment, relationships with each other, looking at the workplace, looking at education, innovating schools so that we bring well-being into the curriculum. And, uh, and so we can, we can make sure that students have that kind of awareness, personal awareness of how they're feeling, and we can create safe environments where they can uh, experiment and grow and give them a, uh, a vocabulary and a language that will elevate their, their well-being and, and their success. Thanks, Karen. I agree with basically everything that is said and uh, it, um creates lots of different paths that we could uh, explore. Uh, I'd just like to share something that we discussed today. Like when one of our speakers this morning said that um, you know, she comes from a challenging country, North Macedonia. So even though it's in Europe, it's not exactly wealthy and they have so many you know, uh, mm -hmm. problems with neighbors. Oh, not, let's not get there. But the first um, time that she worked, she was actually working at the radio station. She made 10 euros. 
and she was protecting those 10 euros so much that she eventually lost them mm. and completely blanked right so clearly a very unhappy moment uh, back then Absolutely. and the conversation that we had uh, was that uh, she decided to mention that you no know, during her session was something that she thought was relevant and uh, the way the retort is like well you may have not realized that this small trauma that you had of course is not physical pain but you know mm -hmm. the, uh, losing uh, something special when it's so symbolic uh, is certainly not an enjoyable experience. But probably ever since uh, that negative experience with 10 years probably prevented her from losing 100, 1,000 or 10,000 because she started developing this instinct, this wisdom, uh, one could say, um, to really pay attention to the surroundings when it comes to uh, this kind of uh, uh, weak side, right? And the other thing that uh, I mentioned that uh, could be relevant to quite a few people is like, well, yeah, you're coping with the loss and that prevented greater losses in the future. So it was actually an investment to go through that pain because it may have saved you from something uh, much harsher down the line. But the other thing is she now has a story that she can tell people over and over again, right? No, I worked for the first time, really difficult to get the job, but got paid and I was so keen on protecting that money that eventually I lost it. How much is that worth to you in monetary terms, being able to tell the story, like helping other people understand that um, they also have parallels and not say it's worth a lot more than 10 years, right? So experiences are always a, a form of investment, right? So uh, the little pain you have right now is what's shooting you from the greater pain. And of course you have the vaccination, you no know, you know, parallels and you could try to compare. And uh, this is a, a tiny little thing it was very relevant to her, but um, the uh, much greater and comparable situation, uh, if you're aware, of an author called Mo Gaudet, who wrote So for Happiness. He is also coming from great suffering and pain, uh, losing his son and doing this to honor uh, his memory. So uh, in the, you know, uh, it's almost melancholic, Zane. It's not sad, it's just this mix of feeling of being able to generate so much value to society because through your own personal alchemy, you manage to change pain into meaning, right? And into action and into uh, polarizing people in a positive way, saying this is the direction you're going to, right? So let's do what we can to make sure that people understand that there's a whole tool set for them to uh, get closer to happiness, especially if you consider that happiness is more the journey than the destination, right? Being happy all the time would be extremely boring. No, you just wouldn't have anything to compare. Not possible. With. Yeah, so and, and you, you wouldn't really want to, as in it just becomes, uh, oh, if you want to be happy all the time, just uh, be uh, on a bed taking drugs that will keep your you know, happiness uh, hormones, whatever way you want to package them as high as possible. It's like, do you want to be in that situation? It's like, no, this is not living. Right? Living is the beauty of the fluctuation of going through the experiences of being able to share and being able to change directions. Uh, and the one thing that I mentioned today is also is that when you're climbing a mountain and I, uh, and my picture here is on the summit of Mont Blanc. I, I did it uh, last year to commemorate my uh, 50th anniversary. So I wanted to do something special and memorable. And you have like at least 10 ways to climb Mont Blanc. A, a few in Italy, most in France, some easy, some hard. And um, the, the whole point is you can find the happiness along the way if you're paying attention. Right? And most people, they don't. Right? They're under so much pressure from life and society and friends and family that they go like, uh, let me just conform because it's so much easier. And happiness is something you have to fight for. Right? You need to, to make a stance and say, no, this is not something I'm willing to submit to. Uh, I will explain to people, make sure that they understand where I'm coming from. I wish no harm. I don't want to offend anyone, but this is very important to me. Like, you no, know, making a stand for the right reasons is for me one of the greatest definitions uh, of wisdom, at least a path towards accelerating uh, your journey towards wisdom. So Excellent. Yes, so th everything uh, that you're saying ma it makes sense. Uh, I'm from Nicaragua, so I do know, I do understand the, the, the when you're in a country that's complicated. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, and in losses, 
it, what we categorize a small loss to someone may be a big loss in the moment. So loss, it's a loss. So, so that's that, uh, you know, and Mo, Mo is a, is a close friend. He, um, he ended up, uh, we, we met because of our joint stories and he actually launched his book, Soul for Happy at the World Happiness Summit in 2017. So he's amazing. Um, really, uh, really support his work with One Billion Happy and, and everything. Oh uh, yeah, and you talked about the, the drug scenario. That's not sustainable. So, um, you know, we're about health and sustainability, which is so important. And human beings uh, cannot be happy all the time. That's important to note. There's only two types of people that don't feel negative emotions: psychopaths and dead people. So the good news, if you feel challenging, you're not dead and you're not a psychopath. So that's a good start of the day, I guess. And the uh, uh, Mo was actually a speaker, uh, I believe, on the third edition. Like this is the eleventh edition already, and we, uh, we had a great session. Like we followed up, and uh, we we chat every now and then. He uh, interviewed me for his podcast. If you want to continue that one, uh, which was yeah. actually about my uh, Mont Blanc uh, climbing, it was half the way up the Mont Blanc when uh, we were chatting. And, Excellent. Uh, Excellent. Uh, the one example that um, I would like to share with you, uh, which may be relevant to the work you do is that uh, during the Davos events, you know, getting the teenagers to spend the week together, you know, in principle, we want them to have the best possible week of their lives, right? It mm -hmm. should be super memorable, meeting amazing people, making new friends. And uh, for future events, I mean, I'm in Venice right now. I've been here mm -hmm. from uh, the end of winter, stay for a bit longer. We want to have a Wisdom Accelerator event in Venice and then use that as a template for other places in the world. But you also need to figure out what are the activities that you should have during uh, that week, I mean, that was, of course, is building igloos and you know, learning how to rescue someone from an avalanche in Venice. There's just too many things to do, as you, you can imagine. But so one of the activities that I thought would be super helpful uh, is uh, related to a Japanese pottery art called Kintsugu. I'm yeah. not sure if you're familiar. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I have a pottery in my night table, of course. It's phenomenal, right? Because phenomenal. Uh, one of the ideas is that we could... Uh, get the teenagers to create the pottery and mm -hmm. then wow they're so proud they've done something that they had never achieved before and then he asked them to break it and then try to figure out how they're going to be coping with the loss of course not should be optional they want to traumatize anyone here but the beauty of allowing them to glue it back with the golden paint to make it look even more spectacular you know it's like uh, uh, pottery with character i guess is one way of describing that is the kind of exercise yeah. we like teenagers to have. Like, learn how to cope with loss because it's unavoidable. Like, uh, pain is unavoidable, but suffering isn't, right? The physical pain or the mental pain of going through uh, challenges, they're things that happen to you. And the, the suffering is something you do to yourself, right? But so you, it, some things you suffer for a bit, you know? Some things are quite painful and you will suffer for a bit because they're just so painful. But yes, I totally um, sympathize with uh, with uh, Kintsugi. I, that's uh, that's basically what happened to me mm -hmm. in my life. So I, I, uh, I that resonates very much. I think it's uh, yeah, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful initiative. No, oh, it's uh, really great. So thank you so much for joining. Any uh, final words? So would you like to uh, tell a bit more about the work you do at the World Happiness Festival? When is the next edition? So the, it's the World Happiness Summit and it's uh, happinesssummit.world. So there's more information there. Um, we're going to do, we're planning to do a next edition in the spring, next spring, because uh, I really believe that the full summit should be in person. So yeah. that's important. Looking forward to that. We've been doing some, um, some sessions online to bring the learning and the community and to give people uh, support during this time. Um, so the social media handle is at Wohasu and we provide trainings, et cetera, but, uh, we're really looking forward to having something really, really special for the spring. And I think that people will really be needing experiences, especially experiences that elevate and that have to do with mental health and community and optimism and resilience. And so we're going to be there to provide that, um, for the world so we're very much looking forward to it and invite everyone to be part of our community um the global well-being community and and help us create a happier uh healthier more sustainable world 
Yeah, and it's also very poetic that you have the resurgence, right? The rebirth uh, during spring, you know, after the, kind of a, a dark mm -hmm. uh, winter. Yes. Uh, being in a position to uh, you know, look back, reflect, and uh, move towards uh, growth. So fabulous session, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you, so Marcelo. Good. Thank you for your work and thank you for your invitation. Thank you so much.